First Peter chapter four, verse one. <clears throat> I'll make all the Second Amendment people happy with this verse. Second, First Peter, I'm sorry, did I say Second Peter? First Peter, First Peter chapter 4. Second Peter is right across the page from chapter 4 in my Bible, so I'm, I was looking at the wrong page. First Peter chapter 4 verse 1, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves. There it is. Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. Turn over to Philippians chapter 2. Verse 5. Starting the reading with verse 5 of Philippians 2. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Tonight I'd like to talk to you about arming yourselves. Arming yourselves with the mindset and the attitude that Jesus had And there's about three or four things I'd like to bring out from the passages I read to you tonight. There's there's this matter of suffering, and you can't get away from it. Uh, We've all done a little of it. Some have done more than others. I think I pastored a man, and I think he died when he was 95. I pastored him for about 30 years, and He had just a few little bumps in the road in those 95 years, but for the most part, he didn't have as much as a headache. He had a few little bumps in the road. But as far as 95 years of living on earth, he had very little suffering compared to most people that I know and met. But it's not like that for everyone. And we're not used to suffering as a rule. And therefore, our mind is maybe not thinking the way Christ's mind thinks when it comes to suffering. Let me reread verse 1 of 1 Peter 4. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with that same mind, a willingness to suffer for others and for Christ. That was the mind of Christ. That was the attitude of Christ. He He brought that to bear. He willingly endured. He suffered tremendous agony. He suffered tremendous pain. He suffered rejection. He suffered abuse, both verbal and physical abuse. He suffered ridicule, rejection. He knew the whole gambit of suffering. And yet he chose to submit himself to that when technically he wouldn't have had to. I believe that God sent his son, but I also believe that his son willingly agreed to come. I don't believe believe Christ was forced to come. I don't believe it was a matter of coercion. I believe it was a matter of choice that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, when they ordained this plan of redemption, that they were all going to play a specific role in that, and the role of Christ was to come down to earth and suffer. And he did. And it tells us to arm ourselves. And that word arm literally means get your weapons. Not your ARs or AKs. But get your mind girded up with the very thought that suffering is part of living for Jesus Christ. Because we have had it so good for so long and we've known so little of opposition and true persecution, 
It seems foreign to us to think that that would be a part of the plan. But the Bible plainly reads that all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And uh, we realize today that the church is pretty, pretty tame as opposed to maybe 75 years ago and John T. Hatfield was dragging him from the back of the tabernacle up to the altar to get him prayed through. If you haven't read John T. Hatfield's book, you ought to read it. He was a wild man. You think I've been crazy. You ought to have met my Uncle John. Now, we're no kin as far as I know. But uh, if you'd have met my brother John, and we are kin that way. But he actually did some crazy, crazy things that would seem so, well, you'd get arrested today for doing what he did in some of the services. We're tame. We're tame. We really don't go out and tell it on the streets, and we really don't put placards uh, in our automobiles, and we don't put bumper stickers on our cars anymore. We're, we're really pretty tame about this thing, and therefore we haven't suffered much. We've been so quiet that we've kind of come under the radar, I think. But it's going to come to a point, just like this vaccine has bringing things to a point, that you're going to have to you're going to have to divulge that you're a Christian and there's certain things you're not going to comply with. And then, and then the persecution starts. And then the test is on. So if we would prepare ourselves, Paul tells us in Galatians to put on the armor of God, put on the, the, the defensive mechanisms, the helmet, the breastplate, the loins, the girdle of the belt around the loins, the feet shod with, with gospel boots and shoes taking the shield of faith, all defensive armor that will help us against the fiery darts of the enemy. And the sword of the Spirit is our offensive weapon. But, you know, that's the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. And we need to have a command of the Word of God. We need to know what we believe. We need to know when pressure comes that we're going to be able to give a, every man a reason of the hope that lies within us. In meekness and in fear, God teaches us in his word that when the, when the persecution comes, we need to be ready. Sanctify the Lord God in your heart and be ready to give any man or every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that lies within you in meekness and in fear. And so we need to prepare our mind. Get our mind thinking in the right direction. You know, we might think that if something bad happens to us, God's mad. We might think if something bad happens to us and somebody does something mean to us that we've done something wrong. We must have sinned. You know, there's people that go to that, jump to that conclusion at the very first sign of trouble. That shouldn't be our mind. Blessed are ye when men shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Just read your New Testament. And if you read, and I thought about doing a, a series on 1 Peter. Every chapter in these first five chapters deals with some form of suffering. In 1 Peter, you'll find suffering in all five of these chapters. And as you study that and think about that and read that, you find out that suffering was, was part and parcel with being a Christian in the early church. And maybe should be even in our day. But we need to arm ourselves. We need to, we need to fortify ourselves mentally so that we can be prepared. If we're not prepared, it's, it's just like for years I have, I have stayed away from the pre-trib rapture uh, theory. I have stayed away from that because I feel like it gives people a sense of false security. If we think that we're going to escape all the trouble that's coming on this earth, we're not going to be prepared if that's not the case. And we need to think about where we are in the time frame that we are and see prophetically how this is going to turn out. Daniel said it's going to be a time of trouble such as never was or ever shall be. And then shall we be caught up to the Lord. Jesus said in Matthew, after the tribulation of those days, you'll see the sign of the Son of Man coming. And I know there's, there's all kinds of interpretations on prophecy, and I certainly am not smart enough to have the last word. But as I read and think and look at the Revelation and look at the Antichrist and the mark of the beast, and if the church is gone, well, there's no, no one going to refuse it. 
Everyone that's not in the book of life is going to accept it readily. What would be the use of the warning? What would be the use of the exhortation not to take it if there were no Christians here to take it? And when Paul writing in Thessalonians, as I, uh, I think I read that this morning, that that day shall not come except that man of sin be revealed. The Antichrist is going to be revealed before the Lord comes. Whether that's the middle of the tribulation, the beginning of the tribulation, someone smarter than I will have to figure all the timetables out. But what I read is, is we're not going to escape everything that's coming. You said, but the Bible says we're not appointed unto the wrath of God. We're not. But when God judges a world, everybody in that world is going to partake of some of the suffering. When God judges a nation, everyone in that nation is going to suffer. There were, I mean, there were good people in Jeremiah's day that were carried captive into Babylon. Not because of their sin, but because of the nation's sin. And so, church, we just need to, to as, as Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 2, let this mind be in you that was in Christ. As it relates to suffering, Jesus knew he was going to suffer before he came. He came anyway. He had his mind made up. Whatever it takes, whatever the cost, I'm going through with this. I've taken on this mission, and I shall succeed. And we need to have the same mindset. Whatever it costs, wherever it leads, if it's jail, if it's, if it's death, if it's you know martyrdom, Whatever or wherever it leads, Lord, I intend to stay true. I intend to hold on. So let that mind be in you as it, retains, as it pertains to suffering. And then as you look over there in Philippians chapter 2, there's three or four things I'd like to mention. He says, let this mind be in you which was in Christ, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He knew his relationship to the Father. He didn't try to belittle it and make himself smaller than he was. He didn't try to exalt it and make himself bigger than God the Father. He knew who he was. We need to know where we are with God. And don't try to take down on it and make out like you're, you know, that, you know, that it's not, uh, you're not there. If you're an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ, if you're a Christian today, you have all the rights and privileges of a Christian. And we need, to, we need to get to the point where we are just confident enough in our relationship with God to let people know, I'm saved. I'm sanctified. I'm walking in all the light. That's not boasting. That's simply declaring where you are. And if it is the truth, that's what you should do. We need to get back to knowing where we stand with God. It doesn't help you to make your, your standing with God look smaller or weaker than it is. That only defeats you. And it certainly would not be coming to you to elevate your position where you stand with God. That would be hypocrisy and lying. But Jesus, though he was God, though he was God, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, he said, I am the Son. And he was. He knew his relationship, and he stood on it, even though he was ridiculed. He was accused of blasphemy. He was accused of being full of devils and demons, and yet he stood on the reality, God is my Father. And, you know, in our relationship, we need to get that settled too. That mindset has to be there, that we know in whom we have believed is another way the Apostle Paul put it. I know in whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. He knew who he was serving, the God whose I am and whom I serve. I mean, Paul has some wonderful phraseology that just gives a sure, steady, confident testimony of his relationship with God. Should not we be the same? If we know we're saved, we shouldn't have any hesitancy to declare to the world, I'm saved, and what are you saved from? I'm saved from sin. I quit the sin business when I got saved. And so did you if you got saved. Amen. But we need to have that relationship so established that we can be confident 
and consistent in letting the world know I am a Christian. I am saved. I am sanctified. My heart has been made clean. The Holy Spirit abides and resides in my soul. And it is well with my soul. We love to sing that song. It's a beautiful song. Tragedy behind the song. The death of his family, part of his family drowned in the Atlantic Ocean. And yet he could sing, it is well, it is well with my soul in the midst of, of grief, in the midst of loss. He could have said, why, Lord, did you drown my family? That's not the tone of the song at all, is it? He said, it's well with my soul. He had a mind, the mind of Christ realizes that God makes no mistakes. God doeth all things well. And God, in our relationship with him, we are his children, sons and daughters of God. We should stand on that. Let the mind that Christ had be in you. Secondly, he said, but, he, 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 though he thought it not robbery to be equal with God on one side of the coin, on the other side of the coin, it didn't think, he didn't think it was beneath him to become a servant. The Son of God, second person of the Trinity, washing fishermen's feet. Can you imagine the condescension? Can you imagine coming down from that level? It's a long way from the portals of glory to washing fishermen's feet. It really is a long way. But that's the beauty of the mind of Christ. Though he knew he was the Son of God, he also realized that he had come here not to be ministered to, but to minister. And really that's what we're here for, is not to be ministered to so much as to minister to someone else. As Christians who have been serving the Lord for years, saved and hopefully sanctified, then we, as our job, we're here to minister, to serve. And that should be the mindset of the Christian. I'm here to help you. I'm here to help everyone that I can help. Even your enemies, if I can help them, yes. Absolutely. It's very important that we understand that Christ's love goes beyond all the things that gets in our way. <laughs> the feelings, the emotions, the circumstances, the, the problems of life, the cares of life, these all get in our road and we lose sight of what the main goal is. But Jesus said, let this, or Paul writing to the Philippians said, let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. Though he was equal with God, he was willing to get down and take a towel and do the most menial task of a house slave. Their house slaves washed the feet of the guests when they come in. Of course, the, the upper room was empty. He didn't have a house servant up there that night. So Jesus did it. As, a, as an illustration, as I've done it unto you, as I have served you, as I have humbled myself to do this menial task, so you should be willing to humble yourself and do the menial task. Amen? Amen? I don't know if it's making any sense to you or not. Let this mind be in you, which was in Jesus Christ. Arm yourself. Be weaponized against the enemy by having the mind of Christ. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Another great condescension. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him. Now I'd skip verse 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient. Christ, following orders, I believe you'll find that whatsoever his father willed, Christ willingly did it. Whatever the Father would say, Christ would gladly assume the role of an obedient son and follow those commands. And so, you and I need to be in that same spiritual mindset that whatever God wants, 
is what God gets from us. We have an eternal yes, an unequivocal yes in our heart to God. Lord, I want what you want. And whatever you say, I'll do. Wherever you send, I'll go. Whatever you want of me, I will give it. Amen? That was the mind of Christ. And let that mind be in you. He was willing to serve. He was willing to obey his heavenly Father even though he was co-equal with God. That's, a, that's an amazing thing. But we're going to have to get to the place where we're willing to, to just be obedient. Lord, whatever you say, I'll do it. Whatever you want me to do, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. You know, there's, there's a great delight. There's a blessing that comes with, with this obedience that, that is wholehearted and, and prompt and you know, this delayed obedience and partial obedience, that, that gets us in trouble spiritually. But I want you to know there is a blessing which accompanies fervent, instantaneous obedience to the voice of God. And I believe that we need to get back to that, to get the blessing back in our lives. We need to have that, that sense that, Lord, whatever you say, whatever you want, I remember emptying out my wallet on more than one occasion because I felt like that's what the Lord wanted me to do. But God knows our, our resources. He knows our capabilities. He knows the things that need to be tested as in Abraham's life. His love of Isaac was such that God felt like he needed to let Abraham know. God already knew, but let Abraham know that he loved God more than he loved Isaac. There's tests that come into our life, and God does that. And so we find out that I need the mind of Christ that when God whispers, he doesn't have to shout or count to three. My daddy wasn't a counter. I don't know if he couldn't count or just didn't want to. But after the command came the hand, and uh, you wish you had jumped when he said jump. And you say, well, God isn't like that. No, he isn't, not exactly like that. But I believe his expectations are the same, that when he speaks to his children, he wants them to move and do what he's asked them to do. I believe Jesus said, I always do those things that please him. Always, he said. We probably can't say that because we're human enough to miss it, we're human enough to tarry around sometimes when we should have been doing something quicker. I failed one night in a desperate way years and years and years ago. I was probably still in my first pastorate. We were at the hospital visiting someone. There was a person across the hall and the spirit kept nudging me and nudging me to go across the hall. And uh, I looked across the hall. The door was open. There was people in there talking by the bedside. I said, okay, Lord, I'll go when those people leave. Well, those people left, and when they left, they pulled the door to. I said, Lord, what am I going to do? They, they shut the door. Does that mean they don't expect anyone else or don't want anybody else? And I, I let myself be talked out of it. I didn't go. But I spent a night in the woodshed that night. And all I could see was that soul on the other side of that hallway going to hell because I had failed to quickly obey the voice of God. He taught me a lesson that night, a real pertinent lesson. When he speaks, friend, we need to go, regardless of what the situation looks like, regardless if it looks like the door is shut, I should have tried the door. I should have went over and knocked and seen if they would have let me in because God had told me to go over and witness to that person. But I told the Lord that night in repentance, Lord, if you will let me live till morning, and if you will let them live till morning, I will go back to the hospital, and I will go into that room, and I will tell them about the love of God. And I did. I did. Because I don't like the woodshed. I don't like the chastening of the Lord. He chastens everyone that is a son or daughter, and, and no chastening for the present is pleasant, but it's effectual if we'll submit to it. It taught me a valuable lesson that night. When the Lord says, go, go, boy. And uh, you leave the consequences to him. If 
you get thrown out of the room, that's the, that the consequences belong to him. He said, come in here. And I'm going to go by the help of the Lord. If they'll let me in, I'm going to go. But how quick are we to obey? Do we want to always do those things that please him? Boy, that's a good test, isn't it? That's almost as good as WWJD. You remember that fad that went around several years ago? What would Jesus do? And there was a book in his, in his steps. Thank you. It was almost there. Part of it was there. I read that book and, oh man, that's a great, that's a great lesson. That's a wonderful lesson. Then they started selling wristbands with that on there and necklaces with that on there and everything else with that on there and they really jumped on it and made a, a lot of money out of it. But really, what would Jesus do if the Father asked him to do something? Would he do it? <laughs> he would do it. He said, I always do those things that please him. So friend, you and I don't have an out here. Let the mind that was in Christ be in us. Quick to obey. Willing to suffer. Confident of our relationship in Christ. Willing to become a servant. To be obedient. And he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Even the death of the cross. He was willing to give his life. Because that's what it took for him, right? Nothing short of that would do, would it? If it had just took the beating, I mean, that, 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 there was a lot of bloodshed in the, in the scourging. There was bloodshed in the beating of the thorns down on the brow. There was bloodshed, no doubt, in his face when it was battered by the Roman soldiers, buffeted. Can you imagine a big, brawny Roman soldier? I tell you, when you get hit in the face, it hurts. And especially if you get hit here on the beak, it really hurts. And guess what? It bleeds a lot too. It bleeds a lot. A lot of blood vessels in the face. So there was blood shed. Would, would, would that not do? Would it not do that he had he'd already shed blood in Gethsemane when he was praying so fervently for God to give him the help to get the victory over this physically and humanly? Wouldn't that be enough? Wouldn't that satisfy the Father? No, friend, he had to drink the last dregs of this thing. The wages of sin is what? Death. He had to die. He had to die. He had to give up his earthly life. He had to stop living to be the redeemer of the world, to please God, to fulfill his mission. And friend, we don't know what our mission is yet. But our resolve and our mental attitude in prayer needs to become, Lord, whatever it takes for me to fulfill my mission. Brother Roy Smell called, I think I told you that last weekend. 14 days or 18 days, I've, the numbers are already jumbled up in my mind. 14 or 18 days the first time, 7 days the second time. But he was rejoicing in the fact that God was getting glory out of what he had been through. Would you volunteer for that kind of situation to have that thing down your throat for that many days and be sedated to where you didn't even know you were in the world for that many days? Wake up after all of that sedation and you're paralyzed from your neck down. You can't even move your fingers. They've been idle so long your body won't respond. The muscles and nerves and sinews have to be taught again to move. You have to get them opening up and working again through therapy. Could a man rejoice over that? He was praising God. He could stand on his feet for 39 seconds. Now, I've been standing on mine for almost an hour. Okay? We take it for granted, don't we? But here's a man, though he didn't know the will of God was going to lead him through all of this suffering and pain and near-death experiences, but when he said the head doctor comes in and looks at him and says, buddy, I don't know if you believe in God or not, but if you don't, today would be a good day to start. I mean, when the head doctor of a big hospital comes in and tells you that, friend, God's done something in your room. 
and he was rejoicing. I'm sure he's got a long way back to health even now, but he was exuberant. Why? Because God was getting glory from his suffering. Can that not become our attitude? Amen? Let this mind be in you. Remember, arm yourselves. Christ suffered for us. Arm yourselves with the like, same mind. This is your weapon. This is your defense. As if your mind is made up. If you purposed in your heart like Daniel and the three Hebrew boys, we're not going to defile ourselves with the king's meat. They didn't know what that would cost them. God spared them punishment or death through that ordeal and God was glorified in the way that he worked it. But friend, how many other Babylonian people might have been put to death that we don't know about? Or how many other Israelite people in Babylon? Sorry. Let this mind be in you. Let that mind be in me. I told you this morning, I, I don't like the word scared and I certainly despise the word worry. But as we get closer and closer to this testing time, I want to make more sure and more sure that what I believe I have, I really have. Amen? Amen? Lord, I want the mind of Christ and there's so many other things about the mind of Christ, but, you know, the compassion that he had, the love of humanity that he had. It was just, there, there's just so many things about the mind of Christ, but these four things out of this passage and then the one out of my text in Peter, a willingness to suffer, a willingness to go through something that's physically painful, in order to accomplish the will of God. He said, why does it have to be that way, preacher? You'll have to take that up with someone. That's a, as Obama said, that's above my pay grade. <laughs> I can't tell you why God has put that in the system. Maybe it's part of the penalty for our sins. I don't know. But I do know one thing. If we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. You know the Bible says that very plainly. If we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, and you think how many people is going to deny him when it comes to losing their job, when it comes to the inability to travel or, or buy or commerce, you think how many people are not going to be fortified in their spirit and mind and have their experience and relationship so confidently settled that they're going to say, I can't. You know, God's going to have to, like this, the man in my first church said, God's just going to have to understand. He was talking about working on Sunday. He said, God's just going to have to understand. I've got to feed my family. God's going to have to understand. God's already told us the consequence in our generation. If we're right up against the mark of the beast, and I believe we are, God's not going to understand if you take it because you were hungry. Think about it. God's not going to understand if you take it because your children are hungry. You ought to read Fox's Book of Martyrs. I can't imagine, hardly, I can hardly imagine, let me put it that way. That's better grammar anyway. I can hardly imagine being tied on the sidelines and seeing my grandbabies tied to a stake with brush underneath it. And I hear the testimony of those parents say, don't deny him. Don't deny him. Jesus is going to take you home. Don't deny him. You read that book and parents are telling their children, watching their children be executed that horribly way and telling them to hold on. Telling them not to give up. That's the mind of Christ, I think. That's not normal. 
That's not the natural mind. That's not what we would do under normal circumstances. Do whatever you do to get out of the punishment. Say whatever you got to say to get off the hook. That's the wrong answer in our day. The answer is to have the mind of Christ who's willing to suffer. Willing to pay the price, to be obedient, to become a servant, and if necessary, to die for the faith. That's the mind of Christ that I want. You said that's kind of, uh, what's the word? That's, that's just kind of, preacher, that's kind of gloom and doom. That's kind of, you know, we don't, that's morbid. That's the word I was looking for. That's morbid. If it never comes to pass, you have not lost a thing by seeking the grace and the mind of Christ to suffer for him. If it never comes to pass, and all this was so unnecessary tonight, you'll say, preacher, you sure did scare us for nothing. I'll rejoice with you in heaven. But friend, if you and I go to the stake, figuratively, it won't be that probably in this day and age. But if you and I go to the grave by the way of a martyr's crown, and we get to heaven... You're going to look me up and say, Preacher, I sure am glad you helped me to think about what I might have to go through and get me prepared for that. It's like car insurance. You drive years and years and never have a wreck. It seems like a waste, doesn't it? Till you have that one accident. And you're so glad you had it. This is insurance, friends. This is insurance to make sure if the test comes and when the test comes in our lifetime, if it does. I'm no prophet at this point. I've asked God to show us and give us wisdom for the days in which we live so that we can admonish the people. But these are the messages the Lord is giving me. I don't, I don't have a schedule. I didn't get it off the internet. I don't have 52 sermons I buy every January and preach those. I, I don't do it that way. This is, this is the thought the Lord has given me. Amen. And I think the Bible pretty much backs me up 100% on the warnings. Read this week. As your devotional, read all five chapters very slowly. Underline the parts of each chapter that deal with suffering. And see what Peter says. James said, count it all joy, brother. <laughs> he must have been one tough dude. Count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations. I'm not there yet. Some things I don't think are joyful. But he had gotten to the mind where whatever came his way, maybe he could do like Paul says, give thanks in all things. We have, some, we have some work to do in this area. Westerners, Americans. We have some work to do in this area to get our mind to think in a little different way than what we've been programmed to think. That we're all going to have a smooth sailing ride. Be a few bumps, but we're going we're gonna to ride smoothly right into the portals of glory. Would our Chinese brethren have any sympathy for that thought or doctrine <laughs> when they're meeting underground at the risk of their lives and imprisonment and they're meeting underground just to have a little service where they have to whisper? Wouldn't I be in a mess if I was in an underground church and have to whisper? I'm too loud for that. Lord, I'm not cut out for underground church work. But who knows what we'll do before we get out of here? Let's let the mind of Christ be in us. What do you say? What do you say? I want the mind of Christ. I want to live the way he wants me to live. I want to be obedient. I want to be confident of my relationship. Not belittling it or taking down on it or not exalting it, but just right where I am. I want to be confident that I'm in the center of God's will, saved and sanctified, walking in the light, 
Amen. And I want to be a servant. I want to help someone else. I just need God's help in a special way. Anything on your heart before we dismiss the service? I did preach longer than usual tonight. That's why you look sleepy. All right, thank you phone people for being on the conference. We appreciate it so much. Keep us in your prayers. Any way I can help any of you, just get in touch with me.